Thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Schwab Coaching. My name is Cameron May. It's 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on a Wednesday afternoon. The closing bell has just sounded. That means that it's time to get, get back to our ongoing weekly series of discussions called Generating Income in Your Portfolio. And three weeks ago, we launched this new series. And since then, we've learned about dividend investing, covered calls, and short puts. And today, we're going to wrap up those three income strategies into one strategy known as the wheel strategy. It's going to be a good discussion. We're going to be using uh, two platforms to examine that strategy. We're going to be actually placing an example trade before we're done. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Why don't you go in, chat in just to get things rolling. Let me know if you're familiar with this strategy. But before we can get into anything and any of that, what we first need to do is discuss the risks of investing. Please bear these disclosures in mind. Options carry a high level of risk and are not suitable for all investors. Covered calls provide downside protection only to the extent of the premium received and limit and the up, limit upside potential to the strike price plus the premium received. The cash secured put strategy risks purchasing the corresponding stock at the, at the strike price. When the market price of the stock will likely be lower. There are risks associated with investing in dividend paying stocks, including but not limited to the risk that stocks may reduce or stop paying dividends. And short options can be assigned at any time up to expiration, regardless of the in the money amount. Okay, so with that said, let's set the agenda for the day. First two items, we're going to go relatively quickly through. It's a repeat of previous weeks. We want to leave the bulk of our time for that third bullet point item. But first of all, we're going to do a quick re recap on what is income generation. What do we mean by that? Then we're going to discuss, as an overview, the types of income uh, generation strategies that are potentially available to the self-directed investor. But then we're going to dedicate the bulk of our time to looking at examples on the platform, including a quick recap of what's happening with the stock market, the fixed income market. So let's get right into this allow ourselves some good time to discuss the wheel strategy. So what is income generation? Well, it's income generated from investments within an investment portfolio. It can include various types of earnings derived from an investment, such as interest and dividend income. Obviously, in this series, we also discuss using options for income. This is typically employed as a buy and hold strategy, seeking some stable income with minimal volatility on the underlying assets. That's a pretty good description of the, of, uh, the, the general outlook of, a, of a, an income-oriented investor looking for income without too much volatility. But that doesn't mean that we can eliminate risk. Among the risks included in um, uh, income investing are market fluctuations that can affect the value of the investments. Certainly that's a risk, but there are others, and we'll, we'll want to weigh those against any potential advantages in the strategies that we discuss. All right, so what are the potential strategies for income investors? Well, the ones that we discuss in these series are described in these first three columns. Dividends, something known as REITs, it's an acronym for Real Estate Investment Trust, and options. Dividends can be paid in the form of cash or stock. In this webcast series, we focus more on cash dividends and they are gonna play a role in today's discussion. Real estate investment trusts are very much like a mutual fund in that rather than, rather than investing directly in hard real estate assets or in the loans that support real estate, the investor is in investing in a portfolio of real estate related assets that's managed by a professional money manager. Now that approach might include um, exposure to commercial real estate, residential, healthcare, industrial and mortgage, uh, mortgage-backed assets, but with all of those, they do carry risks that are similar to directly investing in real estate. Now, we are gonna be spending the bulk of our time today on option strategies. So we've become acquainted over the last, the last two weeks with covered calls and short puts. And this wheel strategy is gonna lean on our understanding of both of those. Now, I'm gonna to try to go at a, at a pace that, that, everyone can, that, that everyone can follow, but we are gonna be using both of those strategies to, uh, to look, for example, income opportunities today. Now, finally, obviously, income investors could invest in bonds. We're gonna take a quick peek at the bond market, but investment in bonds is essentially a loan from an investor to, uh, to a, an a income paying um, 
uh, municipality, uh, corporation, uh, treasuries, or there can be investments in bond funds, pros and cons to that approach as well, okay? But let's get right to some examples today, and we're gonna lead off with a quick review of what's happening in the markets. So let's go right to Schwab.com. So I've just logged into an example account here. I'm gonna pop right up to the top, and let's have a look first at what's going on with the stock market. So chart symbol for the stock market. Uh, for one of the indices, obviously, it depends on investor preference. Other investors might, uh, might prefer to use different indices, you know, the Russell or the uh, NASDAQ. But let's look at the S&P 500, and we're gonna load up a chart here. What's happening with the S&P? Well, stocks have had a pretty nice run stretching all the way back to November of last year. Uh, we've been in recovery mode. For those that are more technically oriented investors, they might see this as a series of higher highs and higher lows leading us all the way up to these July 27th highs. But since then, we've seen cycles downward, selling off to lows here the third week of August, rallying up as we move towards September. You'll notice that early September peak was not able to reach up to where we were in July. And for some, that might, might be a sign of early chart weakness, especially if it's combined with, with a consecutive lower lows. So you'll notice that the lows that we achieved here in the first week of October exceeded the lows of, uh, of mid-August. So lower highs, lower lows, and that's pretty good, fair description of what we're seeing right up to the present day. So is that a guarantee that prices are going to continue to fall? Not necessarily. But for those investors that are leaning on their stocks uh, to appreciate in value to generate performance for their portfolio, it might be a little bit of a difficult current scenario. So what might they do instead? Well, they may turn to income strategies, right? So let's go have a look at what's going on with the fixed income market. And for that, let's just enter our symbol right up here. Dollar sign TNX is going to be my example symbol for today. This is just a chart of the average yield on a 10-year treasury. If you're not familiar with TNX, that's what it is. If you'll notice, there's a value over here to the right that says 49.53. If we move that decimal one position to the left, that's telling us that the average yield on a 10-year treasury is sitting just below 5%. And as a matter of fact, we got right up to about five just a couple of days ago. So yeah, yields have been on the rise and that's true going all the way back to April. So what's been driving these higher yields? Well, probably investor suspicion and it has largely proven true that, that uh, the Fed is gonna be raising rates. The Fed has been raising rates comparatively aggressively to what we've seen and maybe what we've become accustomed to over the last uh, decade and a half. So yields have followed. There's been that sort of a downstream impact and then just today, we saw a bounce in yields again. As stocks sold off, yields spiked up. What may be contributing to that? Well, stocks might be selling because you know we're right in the thick of earnings season. We just saw Alphabet miss some, some significant revenue uh, projections. So stocks are selling, yields increasing. Uh, oh yeah, I see, I'll, I'll read your question there in just a moment. But we also had a very strong new home sales report. Why in the world would we care? Why would, why would fixed income investors care about a strong new home sales report? Well, it, it may um, just indicate that the economy or the demand in that sector is, is maybe a little bit stronger than anticipated. It may provide, let's say, the Fed a little bit of cover if they need to go with that higher for longer outlook for the current uh, federal funds target rate. New announcement coming up in just a week. November 1st is going to be the next rate decision. Looking unlikely that they're going to raise rates, but quite likely that, late, that those rates are going to be maintained at that five and a quarter to five and a half level. Okay. So there's a quick backdrop on what's happening with the stock market and what's happening with the fixed income market. So let's talk wheel strategy. All right. Now, as I've already teased, this is going to be this is going to involve all three of the strategies that we've discussed over the last three weeks. And that includes potentially stock ownership. So we need to find for today an example stock, okay? And this is a strategy where it's important that the investor do this on a, 
on a stock where they may not wind, may they may not mind winding up with ownership of the stock. All right. So just a couple of weeks ago, we constructed an example screen for stocks for a, a dividend investor. So I'm going to pop back up here to our research tab, and let's look for our stocks screeners that are pre-built. Now notice right here, it says here are my recently saved screens. We could access those right up here as well. But we just have the one screen, our dividend screen. So I'm gonna click on that, and that's gonna run the screen as we constructed it a couple of weeks ago. And it's gonna find, as of this moment, 16 stocks that are meeting the, the requirements of that screen. So I know there are a number of you that, are, that uh, didn't get to see that webcast, okay? The nice thing is going forward, starting November 6th, these webcasts are, webcasts are going to be archived and accessible on an on-demand basis. So if you missed the live one, you can catch up, watch the archive. That's, I think that's fabulous. But just as a quick recap for this screen, this example screen, we were looking for stocks that are large or mid capitalization. We're, ta we're talking about multi-billion dollar companies with a dividend yield between three and 6%, with earnings that are growing over the last five years, at least 15%, with a beta between 0.5 and 1.2. If you're not familiar with beta, it's a measure of volatility. An average stock right now has a beta score of about 1.2. So we're looking for average to below average volatility. And finally, a debt to equity uh, measurement of, of just comparative debt loads either no debt, which is pretty rare among these big multi-billion companies, uh, or just under one-to-one -one, uh, debt to equity ratio, all right? So lower debt loads, lower volatility, higher earnings growth, higher than average annual dividend yield, and big companies. That's a pretty good description of what, what uh, kinds of stocks we'll find in this list. And so here are those 16 companies meeting each of those requirements. Now, one of the features on Schwab.com is that when, once we've run a screen, we can click right here on the market capitalization or any of these column headings, and it will just reorganize these either from smallest to largest, highest, or pardon me, lowest to highest, or reverse that, highest to lowest. And what do we have right up here on the very top of this search result? Well, we have ExxonMobil. That's going to be our example position today. Um, it is a company that's paying a 3.36% dividend. It's a little bit above average. It may add, uh, you know, let's say an investor is looking to the energy sector for a little bit of portfolio diversification. Could be all sorts of reasons. I'm not here to, to provide a sales pitch or a promotion of a specific stock, but just if an investor is is okay with or even excited about potential ownership of a stock, then the wheel strategy might be, um, might be appropriate if income is uh, a primary motivation for them. Okay, so let's talk about that wheel strategy. And to do that, now that we've selected a stock, I'm gonna change platforms on you. And this, even if you're a veteran of this webcast series, even if you're a veteran of the Schwab coaching uh, series in general, this may be a pretty new platform to you. It's known as Thinkorswim. It's a trading software that's intended to be a complement to the resources that are already available to you on Schwab.com. So you may need to download that software if you haven't done it already. And to access that, I'll show you where it should be. In my demonstration account, I don't have the link, but I can show you where the link would be, okay? So to access that, you just go right up here to trade. And right here under trading, plat oh, there it is. What do you know? It's been added to my to my demonstration account, but you go to trading platforms, there's the Thinkorswim desktop that can be downloaded right there. Doesn't cost anything, just takes a moment, you download the Thinkorswim desktop software, and you have access to a whole new suite of tools for trading and for analyzing pos positions from uh, a trading perspective or even an investing perspective, which is more of the emphasis for this series. Okay, so once you've downloaded that Thinkorswim, you're gonna wind up with an icon on your computer's desktop that looks like this. Let's go to Thinkorswim and right up here, you'll see there's little starburst looking, kind of a splash looking icon. That's where you would log into Thinkorswim each time and you just use your typical Schwab login, okay? 
And as you log in, it'll ask you whether you want to use paper money to do some practice trading, some practice strategy evaluation, some practice tool usage, or you can log into um, your real trading, your, your real accounts and, do, and, and uh, trade those as well. All right, so here we are, we're within this Thinkorswim trading software, and we've landed on a chart for the S&P 500, and I'm gonna come over here to the left column. The column has a series of what we call gadgets. One of those is our scratch pad, so I can make some notes for you. Let's outline this strategy known as the wheel strategy, okay? So we have the wheel strategy, and the you know I know a lot of things. I do not, I am not, uh, fantastic typist, so you'll just have to forgive me on that point. But uh, our wheel strategy, as a matter of fact, let's make this all bold. Let's go ahead and bold this, there we go. But it's essentially a three-step strategy. So let's start with step one. And step one is sell a put. Remember, all throughout this strategy, we're looking for income and selling options for income is one approach that some self-directed investors will employ in, a, in an effort to diversify their options or their, their choices for income strategies. So if you're not familiar with selling a put, I'll explain in greater detail in a little bit, but really it's a contract. And that contract contains a potential obligation to buy shares of stock, okay? That's why it was important for me to go out and find a stock that hypothetically our investor might be interested in, uh, in owning, okay? So step number one, sell that put, get into that contract, and it may require us to buy the stock. If we are required to buy that star stock, we call that assignment. So what do we do? If we're assigned those shares and we wind up with ownership, well, that allows us to apply apply our second strategy. If we own shares of stock, what could we theoretically do at that point? Well, we could recruit our second income strategy, move on to step number two, and sell covered calls. Now, if you aren't familiar with a call option, again, it's a contract, but this is a contract that obligates us not to potentially have to buy shares, but to sell shares of stock, all right? So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a moment, but we're in that contract. Step two, we're moving down the line. We're getting that wheel turning, providing income all along the way with their associated obligations. Now, if we get assigned on our covered call contract and we have to sell our shares, oops, if we're assigned, that means we are now out of those shares, we are fully back in cash, and we can move on to step number three. Step number three is just to uh, repeat step number one. So this is a pretty basic description, but I think a fairly accurate one, of this strategy known as the wheel strategy. It's really just implementing income strategies using options surrounded or th th that uh, really surround a stock that we wouldn't mind owning at times. And during those times, there's something that might grease the wheel. And that is if it's a dividend paying stock and we wind up with ownership and we hit an X dividend date while we own that, whether we're in a contract or not, well, we're gonna collect a dividend along the way. So three potential sources of income in this strategy. So I'm gonna hit the pause button here for just a moment because I do wanna read this. It's a little bit longer chat question. And I really do appreciate the interactive nature of these uh, webcasts. I think that's fabulous. I definitely um, promote that. Let me just read through this. Let's see. Uh, you know what, maybe that, uh, so it's a good question. I might need to park it as an idea for a future webcast. It require, it's a really a more in-depth discussion about how to manage um, maybe covered call strategies that have gone sour. Great, great topic. I definitely think it fits in this series. It's not gonna be a point of emphasis today, but I don't wanna be, be dismissive of it, not my point. I just wanna make sure that we stay on track, okay? All right. So let's talk about step number one. Well, here's XOM. 
And what has XOM been doing this over the last 12 months? If you look at the chart, really doesn't appear to be doing much. Now, right down here on Thinkorswim are drawing tools. So we can choose all sorts of tools, draw trend lines, draw channels. I'm just gonna select the trend line tool. And I'm gonna make a drawing up here at the top of our chart by clicking once, moving to the right and click again. And let's just do the same thing down at the bottom, okay? This is just to emphasize that, you know, XOM, it's been going up and down throughout the year but not doing a whole lot. Now, for, for the equity investor who's hoping, hoping for appreciation, that's not terribly productive, but boy, over the last three months, not a lot of stocks have been very productive. But what might be done during these same circumstances that could be productive? Income strategies, okay? <laughs> yeah, so he said, the, the person that asked the question says, thank you. I'll keep an eye out for a future webinar. Please do that and PS Boo Tesla. Okay, that's a, you know, yep. Um, might need to uh, review that stock in a future webcast as well. Anyway, uh, what's been going on with Exxon recently? Well, within this channel, it's been working its way toward the lower side and maybe an investor sees that as potential buy opportunity. Appreciation, even for an income investor, not necessarily a bad thing, but it also looks like there might be a bit of a price floor recently right around that 105 level, okay? So we're gonna build an income strategy around the assumption that our stock remains above that 105 level for a little while. Now, I'm gonna do one other thing for you. And again, I try to go at a pace so everybody can follow. I'm gonna come up here to my settings. This little gear icon up at the top of our chart is a settings icon on Thinkorswim. Now, if I click on that, I can go to the time axis, because we're going to be setting up a, a contract that expires on a certain date, a future period of time. So let's go to a time axis, and I'm going to check the box for show the expiration Fridays for our options contracts. So let's click apply and click OK. And what you'll see here is we now have these red dashed vertical lines that, so, that show us the contracts that expire on the third Friday of the month. So for the options traders in the audience, this is going to be an important visual reference point. But let's just make a trade for step number one, where we're gonna sell a put, which is gonna benefit, gonna provide an income, and is gonna be positioned well to realize a profit as long as our stock stays above 105 through November 17th, okay? That's the plan. So let's go to our trade and let's implement our example trade on step number one. We're gonna sell a put. And anytime I introduce a strategy that's, that's likely to be new to members of my audience, I like to explain what I'm doing so we can understand the pros and the cons of doing this. So I'm going to the trade tab to place a trade here on the Thinkorswim platform. We're gonna make sure that we have the right symbol here. And then on this page, we can see something known as the option chain. And as I look down through that chain, I can see all these dates and this number in parentheses. These dates, these are, this is like an advertising bulletin board for contracts that we can, we can get into with other market participants out there. Some of those contracts are good for two days, or in other words, through the 27th of October. Others are good for as long as 814 days on XOM or through the 16th of January of 2026. And you'll also notice the number 100 here. This is for the poten potential exchange of 100 shares of XOM. These are what we'd call standard options contracts. So we're gonna be getting into a contract that might require us to buy 100 shares of XOM. Guess what? Again, it's a hypothetical scenario, but we're okay with that, okay? So let's look now at the 17th of November. Remember, on my chart, there's the 17th of November. And we made this kind of bold assumption, maybe we stay above that. And we're gonna get this income wheel turning. So the way that we generate income with options that we sell. So I'm gonna go to the 17th of November and write down the center column, you're gonna see all these numbers. These are numbers, these are prices at which, notice that the column heading says strike. They're prices at which we might strike a deal 
to maybe exchange shares of stock with someone else. So I'm gonna to go to the right side, that's where our put options are, and I'm gonna go down to the 105, 17th of November puts, and we are going to sell the 17th of November, 105 put, and if we look at that, at the bid and the ask price, it looks like bid is about 181. That's when we're selling, we typically fill at or near that value. When we buy, we typically fill at or near that value. Now, for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna be a little bit ungenerous to myself. Let's say that we sell that option for $1.80, okay? This right here, this little line, is a pretty good description of the entire contract that we're about to get into. Now, um, if you didn't catch our discussion of selling puts from last week, keep an eye out for those archives. You should have access to them before too terribly long, and you can go back and, re and, and watch that archive. But uh, basically, if I click on this bid price here, and I'm going to go ahead and begin to place this order, I'm going to click on the bid price for the 105 put, that creates an order right down here. And pardon me, I'm gonna give myself, no, let's do it this way. I'm gonna widen this out a little bit so that you can see this is for 10 contracts. All right, let's just dial that down to just one, okay? But if we sell this put, here's what's happening. Someone is paying us $1.80 per share on a contract that has how many shares? 100, okay? So it's $1.80 per share times 100 shares, or in other words, we're getting paid 180 bucks. That's our potential income. But they're not giving us that money for just out of the kindness of their hearts. There's some give and take in this contract, just like there really is in any, right? Um, we're accepting a payment and income but in exchange, we're giving a promise, a contractual promise to another market participant out there theoretically, right? And that promise is, hey, for the next 23 days, or in other words, through the 17th of November, this other mystery investor has the right to put shares into our account through essentially a forced sale at $105 per share. In other words, we're, we're, we could be required on demand at any time for the next 23 days to have to buy shares at 105. Okay, well, let's talk about what may happen if we do this. I'm gonna go ahead and submit this order, as a matter of fact. So let's just sell this. Let's say we're willing to accept $1.80 for that payment. Um, the 105 strike, yep, that's correct. 17th of November, that's correct. I'm submit this, submitting this as a limit order. There's always a risk the order might not fill, especially since the markets are closed. This order, if it fills, would be tomorrow, but let's click confirm and send. Selling that one contract, 17th of November, 105 put, limit of $1.80. That, uh, that's giving me 180 bucks potential profit. How much loss? Oh, we need to talk about that. But there is a transaction fee, a hypothetical commission of 65 cents. So if we get about 180 bucks, that nets out at 179.35 as our minimum acceptable credit. But let's send that order off. And with that, we've put the wheel into motion with step number one. Now we gotta talk about what can happen from here. So let's go back to our charts. And you can see here's our order waiting to see if it fills. Let's assume that it does. Let's assume that that fills. And we're now sitting in a contract, collected our 180 um, options income, but this line now carries a greater significance. That 105, that's sort of a visual reference point for how much we might have to pay for the shares of stock. So here's where we are right now. There's November 17th. You might consider this the finish line for step number one. What if the stock goes up? What if we have a rally? Well, let's say it goes up to 112 bucks by that expiration. Well, think about the terms of this contract. Someone has the right to sell shares to us for 105 bucks. If those shares are worth $112, is it likely that they will require us to buy those shares? So, I mean, twist my arm, make me buy shares that are worth 112 for 105, go ahead. No, it's not likely at all. Most likely they just walk away, they say, Cameron, 
Keep the 180 bucks I gave you and the deal's over, all right? That's a possibility. In this case, assignment did not happen and it would seem like, uh-oh, the wheel just ground to a halt. So with this if, notice that word if, that's a big important word, if we're assigned. If we're not assigned, well now we have $180 and we have no, future, no further obligation, what could we do now? If income is still the emphasis, you know, if XOM is still our most attractive stock candidate, or maybe we just move on to another stock, it doesn't matter which, we could just go back and repeat step number one. Is it a negative outcome to not move to step, step number two? Not necessarily. Okay, so that's one thing that could happen. What else could happen? Well, what if the stock goes down? What if it goes, let's, let's say it goes down here to 104 bucks. And we hit that November 17th expiration. And someone, the, the other party in this contract has to make up their mind at that point. Hey, Cameron, they're saying to themselves, uh, you are required to buy shares from me at 105. They're only worth 104. Might as well sell them to you. Can't get that anywhere else. And they assign the contract. Yep. If the stock price is below our agreed upon strike price by any amount, a penny, a dollar, 10 bucks, and we hit expiration, that contract is getting assigned with very, very rare exceptions. Every once in a while, somebody decides to call up their brokerage firm and say, you know what, even if it's in the money, do not exercise this option. That's not common, but it, it happens from time to time, not very often. Yeah, if we're below 105, we get assigned. What does assignment mean? Well, it means we required to buy the shares at 105. And then um, in that case, we now own the shares, but we also still have the dollar and 80 cents, the 180 bucks that was paid. And what could we do from here? We put the 180 into our cash or we put it, put it to work in some other investment, but we now own 100 shares of stock or 200 or 300, depending on how many contracts we do. And we can move on to step number two. Since we own shares of stock, we can now enter into a, enter into a covered position if we choose to by selling a call option. So we're gonna talk hypothetically from here. One thing I can't do is uh, do an entire trade series for you. I can't roll the wheel into the future except hypothetically. So let's, just, let's assume that we have our second scenario. And by the way, I do not wanna dismiss the fact that if we just bought the shares at 105 and they're only worth 104, are we not sitting on a, on a $1 unrealized loss? And could it be bigger? Yeah, could be bigger. This is not a, this is not a uh, strategy that would typically be applied if we think a stock is just gonna collapse in value because it carries with it the potential for ownership of stock. And when we own stock and the stock collapses in value, that can cost us a lot of money, okay? But let's say we're down here or down lower, whatever, and we wind up owning some shares of stock. Well, when we own shares of a publicly traded company, we might choose to get into another contract where we, instead of agreeing to buy more shares by selling a put, maybe we enter into a contract that obligates us to maybe sell those shares of stock. So let's move our calendar forward on our chart a little bit. There's a feature on Thinkorswim. If you come down here, the little double-headed arrows, click on that we can change what are called the right expansion settings. That sounds fancy. It just means the white space off to the right of the chart, the extra space. So I'm gonna change that a little bit. And instead of having 30 trading days, how about we go out to 40? Let's click apply and click okay. And what that allows us to do is see the next month's um, expiration. And how about now, let's say that we now own shares of stock at 104. Let me just erase this line. And, uh, and let's put in a line here at 104 to sort of show us where, you know, hypothetically we entered the stock position. Now at this point, we could choose to sell a call above the current price of the stock. That's what's typically done in this scenario. And let's say that we go ahead and sell a 105 call, but that doesn't expire on the 17th of November. Let's say that we sell a 105 call that goes out through the 15th of December. 
What does that mean? Well, if we bought shares, so you might think we've we've made 108 bucks or 180 bucks on the income from the original trade. We now own shares of stock at 104, and we're essentially agreeing to maybe have to sell those shares at 105. Now, it doesn't have to be 105. It could be 106, 107, 108. But I do want to point out, if we if we bought the shares, um, well, they're currently at 104. Let me just correct one quick thing here. We didn't actually buy the shares at 104. We bought them at 105. My point here is, if we agree to sell below 105, we may be exposing ourselves to be to selling the stock at a lower price than we purchased it for. Okay. So, let's say our stock does rally up from 104. After we sell that call, let's say it goes up to 108 and we hit expiration. Well, if we've sold a call, that means someone has the right to buy shares from us for the agreed upon price, in this case of 105. And, what, and in that case, if they're worth 108, are they going to buy those shares? Yeah, almost certainly they are. Buy those shares from us for 108 uh, uh, that are worth 108, pay us for 105. Well, we were put the shares at 105, and then we sell the shares at 105. Doesn't that feel like that's a wash? Didn't make any money, didn't lose any money on the share transactions, but we made 180 on the income from the put. We also make whatever we collect on the covered call for the next option cycle, and this is how we get that uh, that wheel turning. Now, with Investors who apply this strategy on a regular basis, they typically just keep it going. They just keep it going. Sometimes the stock goes up, sometimes the stock goes down, sometimes contracts expire without assignment, sometimes they are assigned, but for the uh, investors who apply this strategy, they typically just continue keeping that wheel turning. And just remember, during the timeframes, if we own shares, if we're in a covered call position, and there's an X dividend, who gets that in? Who gets that dividend income? We do, right? So there's that third income strategy. And for some, they consider the the selling of the put and the selling of the covered call as the wheel, right? Dividend income is basically the grease in the wheel, just makes things a, a little bit better. So is this a flawless strategy? And by the way, uh, Doug says, uh, let, me, let me park that question, the flawless strategy question, because Doug just asked a question. How can you change the default 10 contracts to one? I bought 10 contracts <laughs> too many times. Doug, what you can do, come up here to your, this is just essentially your overall platform settings. Anytime you see a gear icon, that means you can customize things, okay? So you can click up there. We're going to go to the application settings, and we're going to go to um, order defaults. Okay, and since we're trading options today, right there, there's that default quantity. So if you don't want a quantity of 10 to be your default, go ahead and change it to one and apply it. There you go. Pretty painless, that'll get it done for you, Doug. All right, so I do wanna talk through, it's, it's fun to talk about how we might make money. Oh, great, so if we sell a put, we get 180 bucks, and then we're assigned and we, and we, uh, set up a covered call and we get more income and we sell the stock at the same price. Well, that's if we sell the stock at the same price. How does this trade break down? Well, if the stock is persistently bearish, if it starts to do this, we might be making income along the way, but we may have attached ourselves through assignment on the put. If, we, if we're assigned on a put, we own the shares of stock, and then the value of those stocks, are, the value of those shares is falling faster than the income that we're generating, um, we're essentially engaged in a slow bleed. So this is not a strategy that uh, would typically be applied if, uh, if an investor is flat out bearish. Even chipping in some more dividends um, occasionally, maybe once a quarter, is that gonna, offset the, the potential for loss on our trades? Nope, no. And you noticed when we placed that, that, that short put order, it said we can make 180 bucks and we can lose a whole lot more? Well, that's because it exposes us to stock ownership. And with stock ownership, there's a lot of risk to the downside, right? So 
We just need to be aware this is not a flawless strategy. I don't want to paint it that way. It is one, though, that, that uh, is probably going to require some repetition the first time one is exposed to it. So if this is the first time you're hearing about the wheel strategy, one of the great features of Thinkorswim is it has this simulated trading environment. So uh, when you learn about a new strategy or you learn about uh, some new tools, you know, maybe not familiar with the navigation of the platform just yet, this is a no-risk environment where you can go experiment. It works almost exactly the same as the real Thinkorswim platform. So uh, I would suggest download Thinkorswim, place your first short put to get the wheels turning on this income strategy, uh, but in a simulated trading environment, in paper money, okay? So, oh, Doug says, uh, oh, very good. Doug says, awesome, thanks. Your example has pretty tight limits. I use, I tend to use deltas around 30. Doug, I get what you're saying regarding delta. That's gonna be a topic again for a future discussion. I wish I could cover everything within the constraints of a 45 minute presentation. We can't do that. We recognize the limitations of our ability to absorb information and my ability to deliver information in that, in that window. So we just, uh, we just uh, will, sort of stick with this agenda for today, but continue to build through the series. That's why I love the series. We can just sort of pick up where we left off, flesh things out, round out our, our understanding of these strategies. Okay, everybody, but uh, with that, we have essentially accomplished what we've set out to do today. Um, I do want to issue an invitation though. If you're not following me on the platform known as X, that is the best place to find me in between these webcast series. I'm very active on X. I, I make posts just about every day, even when on vacation. So if you're following me there on X, my handle at Cameron May CS, the CS for Charles Schwab. I post just about every day and people reply to my posts and I reply right back to those people. And that makes it a more interactive environment than is sometimes available in this, in these sort of uh, webcast series and especially when the, when the webcasts aren't live, that can be fantastic. I also wanna point out that there has been a survey added to this webcast and you can just click the link. If you're following on the live uh, stream, you can just click on the chat or you can click down below. But uh, the survey, if you've never filled out one of those surveys before, really short, it's actually just two multiple choice questions. So it could just be click, click and you're done. But there's also a comments box and a suggestion box. And it's very helpful to your presenters to fill that out. Okay, Ken, you say you love the ideas. Looking forward to the next training session. So am I. I really enjoy these. I uh, really am grateful for the opportunity to be presenting to the Schwab audience. We have a lot still to learn. Coming up in future weeks, we're gonna be talking, yes, more about dividend stock investing. Yes, we're gonna be doing more covered calls and short puts in greater detail. Obviously, when you try to do three in one webcast, you gotta cut some corners, but, um, we're also gonna be getting into real estate investment trusts. That should be a fun discussion. Guys, uh, oh, AG says, do you have to have $10,000 available to buy an assigned stock? That's a great question, AG. With this stock, with, with uh, ExxonMobil, yeah, if we're assigned, that would be a $10,859 purchase or assigned at the, at the uh, strike price, it would be $10,500. If that's done in a margin account, we might only need half of that. But yeah, we need to tailor this, select stocks that are appropriate for our portfolios if we're doing this at all, select strike, uh, select um, priced, the, the, the stocks that are priced appropriately for our portfolios if it's gonna be a strategy that's applied. Never take it as a recommendation when I do these webcasts that uh, I'm suggesting that this is the strategy for you. Nope, it's always just an educational presentation. But everybody, thanks for giving me your time today. I'm gonna set you loose. Um, still a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of education in the weeks to come. I'm definitely looking forward to it, but we've accomplished what we set out to do today. Quick recap of what is income generation. We discussed the different types of income generation, but spent the bulk of our time looking at examples and specifically at that wheel strategy. All right, go enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for, for watching today, everybody. I will see you again next Wednesday.
But do remember as you go, risks, is, risks are real. We did use real examples in today's discussions, not a recommendation or endorsement of those securities or those strategies. I'll look for you in a future webcast. I'll also look for you on X, but whenever I see you again, until that moment arrives, I wanna wish you the very best of luck. Happy investing. Bye-bye.